Welcome back to another weekly Ask GMBN Tech. This, of course, is our Q&A session. If you've got any tech-related mountain bike questions, get them in in those comments underneath. Use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech and we'll pick them up on another show. Right, I've got a whole bunch of questions here on my handy laptop stand uh, in the form of a swiveling vice. Uh, pretty good. Anyway, right, so first question this week is from Guayan Xiong. Why do new stems have a no-gap clamp on the top part of the stem? Is it a new standard or does it have any benefits in some kind of way? Uh, to be honest, it just makes manufacturing, well, it simplifies things because the fact that the manufacturer of the stem knows there's gonna be less weak points in it. So the weak points on the stem will be those four bolts that hold it onto the front of your bars. Now, the reason it's weak is because of the fact it's down to you, the consumer, to make sure each one of those bolts is independently torqued up. And it can be quite difficult to get that. So you might tighten one bolt up but in tightening the other ones up, you're actually affecting the torque of that particular bolt. So by manufacturing the stem with, basically it has to contact either at the top or the bottom where they say zero contact, you've only got two bolts to worry about. Now stems are something that you really should be using a torque wrench with because ultimately it is holding your handlebars on the bike. You don't want to over tighten them, especially if you have carbon bars because the fact that you could crack those bars or damage them in some way or you could snap the bolt as well. So there's a number of things that, that could go wrong. So just take care of that. But essentially, I think it gave the manufacturers of stems a bit more control in what they're doing. It means the bar is better supported. It means you, the consumer, even if you don't have a torque wrench, you're less likely to get things wrong. So that's pretty much it. Uh, next question, Gavin Potter. When you discussed bike manufacturers, you never mentioned Hope. Uh, they make their own, own frames and only a stones throw away from yourselves. Well, Flipping out, you'd have to be a pretty big person for a stone from Bath to, where are they, Skipton or somewhere like that? I forget, they're up north, aren't they? Um, hope seem to be forgotten at GMBN. No, not at all. Um, I'm biased as I have one though. Hey, I've got some hope brakes. In fact, hold on a second. I've got some hope brakes that not many people have got. I just have a little rummage down here. Oh, we look at that. Also found an old Marzocchi Rocco Shock. We'll talk about that another time. That's quite good, I forgot I had that. I got some Hope brakes here. So these ones are Moto uh, V2s. So they've got enormous pistons. They had vented, vented discs on them as well. And these are in the Hope Green, which was the team green. And I love the fact I've got a set of these because not many people have them. I'm sure actually quite a few people have them, but the fact you couldn't buy them in team green. But yeah, you're quite right. Don't refer to Hope enough. They are effectively on our doorstep. Uh, you could say. Now, Hope, of course, no, Barnoldswick, that's where they're based, I just remembered. Everyone in Barnoldswick has a very nice bike with Hope stuff all over it, I'd imagine. A lot of people in Barnoldswick work there. Hope is a fantastic company. You know, it's actually started off the back of, um, they were essentially making parts for minis, as far as I remember, and then they eventually, because they were into motorcycle trials, got into mountain bikes and decided the parts weren't good enough and started making components. In fact, there's a really cool story to tell, so actually, I should go into a bit more depth, you're quite right. But something I've just made a note of here is the fact that um, they're onto something quite good with their carbon manufacturing. So yes, they can make carbon bikes at home in the UK, and yes, they made their own mold for them. Now that's where the penny drops for me. Now think about what's going on with global trading at the moment because of the pandemic and Brexit. And if you're living in the UK, there's a number of issues going on. Now, I have no idea genuinely what Hope's plans are for the future, but I would imagine at some point someone could have thought along the lines of, hey, we're a British manufacturer that can make molds for other brands to make bikes in. Normally you have to send money over to Taiwan or Taipei or wherever it might be, where there's a huge factory that specializes in making molds for carbon bikes. So perhaps there could be something to start up closer to home, who knows? Uh, just throwing that one out there. Um, I'm gonna get in touch with them because I used to speak to Alan Weatherall quite a lot and Woody Hole, of course. Um, they're a great bunch of people and I'm actually, to be honest, they're like amongst a whole bunch of other people. I've barely seen them for, well, I haven't seen them for over a year because of the fact they missed out on all the trade shows. Um, I genuinely love seeing all these people. And it's also made me think as well that I could probably do some kind of road trip, but, um, I'll think about that because I've just seen the next question. It's also along the same lines from the Chisel Warrior. On the topic of visiting factories, please visit Orange Bikes. The fact they're still hand making bikes in the UK is amazing. I feel they're somewhat forgotten in comparison to previous years. Yet, yeah, you know what? I completely agree with that. So perhaps 
a really cool idea, just kind of thinking on the fly here, what I was just touching on was maybe I should do a road trip when, when restrictions lift and hopefully if things get back to normal this year, I have done a road trip for a long time. I reckon I could tick off a bunch of companies, certainly a bunch of companies up north and there's obviously Shand who are up in Scotland, there's Kotick that are up in the peaks, you've got Hope and uh, in Barnoldswick, Orange who are in Halifax, I'm going to say. I've probably got all these wrong, but uh, uh, just for memory, I have visited some of these companies before. And again, there's some companies down south as well. Of course, not everyone manufactures in the UK, um, but I don't know where we draw the line, but I definitely could do like a two-part road trip, sort of north and a south. Yeah, maybe I should get some kind of camper van and take GMBN Tech on the road for a week, week or two, a week or two with bikes on the road visiting tech companies. That sounds like a perfect solution. In fact, I've just sold that to myself. Uh, if you're watching this, uh, Mark, who signs off our budget. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. When, when we can, I will. That sounds like a wicked idea. Go and visit all the companies, see how to do stuff, make some cool tech content, make shows like this with those people that make stuff. We can ask them specific questions about manufacturing. It's awesome. What's not to like? I mean, it's a great idea. Thanks for the ideas. Thanks for reminding me. Okay, next up is from Dale Heffernan. When calculating spring rates for a coil shock, they say to use your, your riding weight, i.e. you plus your kit. But does that include all the bits and bobs that we strap to our bikes, like spare tube, tool, pump, water bottle, etc.? Um, yes, ideally. Now, to get the perfect sag, you want to be at riding weight. That means wearing the riding shoes that might be heavier than your regular trainers. That means wearing your helmet, the carrying a riding pack with the amount of water you would usually carry, and the sort of tools that you usually carry. That's the only way to get perfect sag. But getting perfect sag is a very hard thing to achieve. Uh, the easier way to achieve it, instead of core shock, of course, is with air suspension because you can infinitely tune uh, your sag point on there. Although I still know many people won't do that. They'll get a borderline sag point set up and they'll just run with that. Uh, nothing wrong with that. That works. But if you want the optimum, then you'll, you'll need to do that. Now, on core suspension, I would say it's probably pretty important to do this because of the fact that if, you, if you're oversprung, so if the bike is undersprung for you, so you're running core sprint, it's too, too soft, core, core suspension can feel a bit lethargic. Again, this is down to setup as well, but if you're running a spring that's too soft, you'll find you can just sit too much in the middle of the travel, and the bike just feels a bit, a bit ropey, really. It is important to get it set up right, because coil suspension feels absolutely amazing. Take the time to get it right, though. Uh, and also, because of the fact that you might be sat in between two springs, like, say, a 500 and a 550 pound, or even a 525. Now, if you're sat on the fence there, your riding pack and all that stuff might just make the difference of where you are. You know, so if you're riding without a riding pack and all that stuff, so your bike might be a teeny bit on the firmer side and with the riding pack, everything will be optimized. It sounds like a pretty good compromise to do it like that. So uh, yeah, I, I would do that, to be honest. Next up is from Dominic Byro. Hi, Doddy, I hope this gets in the show. Anyway, recently I bought myself uh, a new to me, so I guess a used uh, Rock Machine Blizzard 27.5 2017 model. I only noticed after paying for the bike that the frame, made from alloy, has three giant dents in it, a medium palm size. Oof, yeah, okay. Uh, what should I do with the frame? Could I just leave it? There are no cracks as far as I could tell. Or should I just save some money and try and buy the frame? Um, should I save some money and try and buy the frame from somewhere? Um, Love the show, been watching this is the 35th. Wow, this is what we're on now, probably 160 or something like that. So thank you very much, that's incredible. Okay, so well, first up, um, how did you buy it? Is a, did you buy it off an auction site somewhere like an eBay type thing? If you did, and the photos of the dents weren't in it when you bought it, then you might be able to get your money back. Um, if it's a sold as seen, then it's kind of your fault for not seeing it and not commenting on it. There's lots of different ways that this can happen, so I appreciate it might not have been that. Um, structurally, depending on how bad it is, it's kind of hard to tell. Has it creased the paint badly anywhere? Because those dents could lead to a crack, they could lead to making a stress riser, if it's like an angled dent or anything like that. Um, it's really difficult to tell, mate, without seeing. So. Yeah, so I've written here, way of refund, missold. Failing that, um, contact the warranty department of Rock Machine. Now, warranty departments operate in a few different ways. If you treat them like human beings, because they are human beings, we're all human beings, you'll find you normally get a really good response. Now, what might happen is they'll say, no, you don't qualify for warranty. But if you're really nice, say, hey, look, I love your bikes, I bought this secondhand, I didn't realize I've been ripped off, so it's got a dent in it. Is there any way you can help? 
there might be a chance, if you get that warranty person on a good day, that they've got a front triangle, that they might be able to give you at a subsidized rate. It's only a mic. They might be able to do something for you. It's worth asking. People at warranty departments are inundated with calls for replacement parts all the time, and you'd be surprised how a lot of customers can be. So we're all humans in the bike industry, and it can be a very stressful place to work, especially when Mr. Smith rode along the pavement, is just riding along, and his bike happened to break in half, and he demands a warranty replacement. Don't be like Mr. Smith be a bit more friendly and hopefully you'll get something sorted. Um, feel free to send a picture in if you're still unsure and we'll have a look at it ourselves, uh, but hopefully you'll get something sorted on that front. Okay, next question. I'm addicted to tea at the moment. Must be a January thing. Um, from Mail Sontanax. During a cold ride, I suddenly felt there was no oil in my front brake. I couldn't brake. When I pumped the lever, pressure slowly came back but left again when I squeezed hard on the lever. Now there's no leak, the pads are in con good condition, and at the end of the ride, the brake returned to normal. What may have happened? Uh, well, it sounds to me that you've got air in the system. Now air can get in the system for a variety of different ways. You could have a minute split in your hose. It could have happened if you shortened the hoses, perhaps. Uh, if you've not, well, depending if it's dot or, or mineral for starters, dot fluid naturally over time ingests on a microscopic level moisture, uh, which can cause problems like that. So a good bleed really is the is the cure for this. Now bleeding brakes is something that everyone should be doing from time to time. Now granted, I've got brakes that I've never touched on some bike, a couple of bikes in my loft, and they're kind of all right, they feel a little bit ropey, but you'd ride them all right. But the thing is, you really should do an annual brake bleed, uh, regardless of the types of fluid that you have, because the fact your, uh, your brakes are gonna work a lot better for that. So don't be afraid of it, it's a very simple basis. In fact, I've actually got a script I've just about completed on basically understanding everything about disc brakes. The principle of bleeding, bleeding top to bottom, like gravity fed, you know, getting the air out the top, all the different systems, how they work, so you can kind of identify what you have. Uh, bleeding brakes is actually really easy. And once you've done it successfully the first time, you'll wonder why you've never done it before, honestly. Don't be afraid of it, just get the right equipment. Don't skimp on it, get yourself a good kit. There's plenty of places online, you can get cheaper ones like Epic Bleed Solutions, I think they're called. Uh, they do a number of great kits, I've got a few of them myself actually. And they're brilliant, they come with the right fluid, they come with the right adapters, syringes, whatever, you know, bleed blocks and all the things you need. And they've actually got some really helpful stuff on their website. In fact, I'm gonna throw a link to uh, Epic Bleed Solutions, should be coming across the screen right now, and I'm gonna throw you a link to our website in the description underneath. Uh, wicked guys, and they really know their stuff as well. So check that out if you're struggling. Uh, next question is from Grant Candler. Hi Donny, loving the show. I watch it every week, including all GMBN content. Flipping it, do you do anything else? Wow, we make a lot of content. Um, I don't know anyone that watches all of it, so fair play, that's amazing. Uh, thank you, big thank you. I'm sure the others will say the same. Uh, I've got a question regarding angle changing head tests. I know you can get them for frames with tapered head tubes, but I've recently discovered you can get them for frames with straight steer tubes. I currently have a hardtail with a straight steer tube. I'd love to slacken out as a bike is great, but it would certainly benefit with a slacker head tube angle. Is it possible you could shed some light on this option? Okay, so ultimately depends on the actual size of your head tube itself and how much room there is on the inside of there. So I think the traditional ones were like 34 millimeters internally. Now, if it's that size, top to bottom, you've got a nominal amount it could move. Now, angle sets, I mean, there's a few options on the market. Works components make angled cup headsets, and they're amazing if you know the angle you want to go for. Whereas an angle set, you can actually tailor it. So each one you buy will have a degree of movement in it from 0.5 to plus 1.5. So, and of course you could run it reverse if you really wanted to, to steepen head angle as well. Although, well, don't know why you'd want to do that, but um, so the point is there's so many different options with top and bottom cups. Now I've had angle sets in the past that have had a, a semi-integrated upper, like a zero stack upper on there with basically no movement on there. And it's all been the movement in the lower gimbal. And I've had ones before where it's been maybe half degree at the top and half degree at the bottom to give a combined angle. So it does totally depend on your option. Now, annoyingly, Ken Creek used to have this really good headset finder on their website and they no longer make it. I don't know if it's still up there and if it's not been updated or if they've just removed it completely, but it was super helpful. Your best bet is to measure up your head tube and basically see if there's any room for movement in there because of the fact you're, you know, you're actually offsetting the bottom of the, the steering tube within it. So yes, with an external cup, you could fit an angle set in there, but it might not physically work on your particular frame. However, if it's a 
even fairly vaguely modern hardtail, even with an inch and an eighth straight head tube, it might be big enough. So fingers crossed for you. Hopefully that works out. And, and to anyone else reading, um, reading, to anyone else watching this, if you have a full suspension bike and you're in the same predicament, another option you might have instead of angle sets is offset, off, offset, offset shock bushings. So they can essentially move your shock positioning. Very, not much, but enough to take like half a degree off, maybe a degree if you're very, very lucky, depending on the option that you have. Now there is a slight downside with offset bushings as opposed to doing the headset version. So when you're adjusting your head angle, you're actually steepening the seat angle slightly on extreme because as the front slackens out, you're lowering. We're talking on a marginal amount here, but you're lowering the head tube of the bike very slightly. So it's possible to, for example, put a 10 mil spacer on and slacken off by a degree and a half and you'll keep your handlebars roughly the same position. Um, or it might go down up to 10 millimeters. And then accordingly, your bottom bracket will go very slightly lower and your seat angle is slightly steeper. Whereas when you do the offset shock, shock pushing option, um, your back end drops slightly. So you're actually gonna lower the bottom bracket, which is a good thing, but you will slacken your seat angle slightly. Again, it's a small amount. However, if you're really keen to uh, lose some angle off your head tube, then there's a way to do it. Another option, of course, is to go up in travel. Uh, roughly 10 mil travel give you a degree on your suspension forks. So it does depend how much where your bottom bracket is, if you think you can get away with that, and even if you want to. And some bikes, you just don't need more travel and you can actually make them worse. So there might be an option there for you. So hopefully you can figure that one out. Oh, now it looks like that's the end of this week's show. Um, out of questions. Uh, awesome show, as always. I love answering your questions. So feel free to uh, get some more questions in the comments and we'll pick them up next week. Cheers, guys.